This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and the first of a two-part special about how to visit the battlefields of Gallipoli. Now this is obviously an iconic destination for so many Australians. If you want to learn about the first Anzacs, if you want to walk in their footsteps, there's no better place to do it than Gallipoli. So over the next two episodes, we're going to talk to you about how to go about that, how to do it, where to go, where to stay, and talk about some secret places that you may not know are there and that hopefully you'll enjoy visiting. The reason we're doing this in two parts is today I'm going to give you the the breakdown on how to go about it, all the facts and figures, the logistics for how to visit the Gallipoli Peninsula. And then next week, we're going to have a podcast interview with Peter Hart, who many of you have listened to before uh, on this series. And Peter spends a lot of his time walking the battlefields at Gallipoli. So he's an absolute expert on walking the ground there. So I'm really looking forward to talking to Peter about that. He's also a total nutter. So I'm sure there'll be uh, a whole range of interesting stories that come out of that podcast interview with Peter. If you have been listening to the podcast recently, you will have heard the special episode I did a few weeks ago on how to visit the Western Front. That was very well received by people. We got a big response to that, and hopefully that's encouraged a lot of people to get out there and explore the battlefields. This will be a similar sort of thing, so the two of them really come as a a neat pair. So use this to help plan that trip of a lifetime to Gallipoli, and what I should say is if you haven't been to Gallipoli, absolutely do it. I know the phrase bucket list gets absolutely overused these days. But this is one of the rare occasions I'm going to say it's actually a valid describer for this situation. You should add Gallipoli to your bucket list. Every Australian should go there. It's really just a wonderful place. The reasons for that are many. The the campaign itself was so iconic. It was such a Shakespearean tragedy, the whole thing. But also the, the landscape hasn't changed very much. The, the greatest enemy for the troops, in addition to the Turks, was the landscape. It was just such a harsh environment. And because of that, it hasn't changed very much since 1915. And it's been very well protected by the Turkish authorities. It's been very well looked after. It's just a wonderful place to visit. So if you're thinking of doing it, absolutely get over there and visit Gallipoli. There's some important things to say about Gallipoli because since about 2016, it has struggled as a destination. Turkey as a whole, I'm talking about here. In 2015, we had that really wonderful centenary of the Anzac landings and anyone who was there, I'm sure, will never forget it. But then unfortunately for Turkey in 2016, they had a whole heap of problems. They had a couple of terrorist incidents. They had uh, an attempted coup of the quite unpopular government that's over there. So it basically a whole heap of things were going on which made uh, Turkey a bit of a questionable destination. And the Australian government, in my opinion, I can say this now because things have changed, but at the time I think the Australian government overreacted somewhat and issued a travel warning saying reconsider your need to travel to Istanbul we felt that was an exaggeration, that the, that the dangers were not great in Istanbul. However, we had to follow the government's advice like everyone else. And so on our tours, we dropped Istanbul from the itinerary. Um, and it really put a whole dampener on the, the Turkish tourism industry. Turkey is one of the world's most popular tourist destinations. It's an absolutely wonderful place. The people are wonderful. It's scenically very beautiful, culturally amazing, and of course, great history like Gallipoli. But, of course, with the government suggesting you don't travel to Istanbul, um, it destroyed the tourism industry. Uh, And Turkey still hasn't really recovered from that, uh, from the events that happened in 2016. The hotel that we used all the time down in Gallipoli, a wonderful hotel called the Tucson, that everyone will remember who's been with us to Gallipoli before. Um, The Tucson has been sold now. It's not owned by the people, that the family that have run it for years that we relied on for such great service down in Gallipoli. So, again, just one of the many casualties from from the the troubles that Turkey has had over recent years. But the good news is that the government has now relaxed those travel warnings. They've upgraded the travel warning to say that uh, just the the standard exercise a degree of caution whenever you're in Istanbul. So the government has now acknowledged that um, there there is not really a, a threat to tourists in that area. So Turkey is a little bit more of an adventurous destination than somewhere like France or the UK, but it's not that adventurous. It's not New Guinea. It's not some far-flung corner of Africa. It's a, it's a very prosperous, welcoming country. Australians are very well received when they go there. There's absolutely no animosity whatsoever about the Gallipoli campaign. And in fact, when you go down to Gallipoli, one of the things that you will appreciate and one of the memories that will stay with you is just how wonderful the Turkish people are and how 
how much things have changed in the last hundred years and there's really just a shared appreciation of the sacrifice that was made in Gallipoli. So to sum all of this up, get over there. If you've ever thought about doing it, don't be put off by nervous Nellies or naysayers who say that you shouldn't go. You absolutely should. I mean, make your own decisions about where you want to go in the world and what travel you want to do. Um, but I think there's absolutely no reason to not go to Turkey because of security fears. It's just not the case anymore. And that's now reflected in the government's travel warnings, which have been updated. So how to visit Turkey? If you made that decision, how do you get to Gallipoli? What should you see when you're there? Where do you stay? How long should you spend? Probably a good idea to give a very brief overview of the campaign, why we were there in the first place, because our reasons for being there are very closely tied to the sites that you can see on the ground there today. So if we look at the end of 1914, so the war had been going on for about six months in Europe. The Ottoman Empire, which comprised Turkey and a whole heap of other states which had come under the umbrella of the Ottomans, uh, all through the Balkans and, and various parts of, uh, of, of that region of sort of Europe slash Asia, um, the Ottoman Empire was struggling and they decided that during the First World War they would throw their lot in with the Germans. They felt that their best chance for getting ahead in the world was with the Germans, so they joined the German side. And jump on a map while I'm talking about this, if you have one in front of you, to, to look exactly where Turkey is. Turkey's unusual that it's the only country that straddles two, con two continents. 95% uh, of it is in Asia, but 5% of Turkey is also in Europe. And the waterway that separates Europe from Asia in that part of the world is the Aegean Sea narrows into the straits called the Dardanelles. And the Dardanelles then become the Sea of Marmara, and that eventually heads all the way up to Istanbul or what was Constantinople at the time. Uh, and the river that runs through the middle of Constantinople is called the Bosphorus, which eventually opens up into the Black Sea. So just imagine a whole channel of islands and lakes and rivers of varying widths that connect the Black Sea to the Aegean and therefore to the world beyond. Now, a bit of politics here to explain why Gallipoli became so important. So the Ottomans joined the side of Germany and so were now the enemy of the Allies. We remember the Allies, the, the three key powers that comprised the Allies were the French, the British and her colonies, including Australia and New Zealand, and the Russians. And Germany was therefore fighting this war on two fronts, the Eastern Front and the Western Front against those combined Allies. Now, if we look at Russia as a specific example, Russia, uh, it's only ice-free ports for its Navy to operate in uh, back 100 years ago and even today. The only ice-free ports in Russia are in the Black Sea in the south, to the south of Russia. Uh, all the ports to the north of Russia, all the water up that way, freezes in winter and the Navy can't get in or out. So as far as Russia was concerned, the Black Sea is absolutely essential to its Navy. It was then and it still is today. And But if you look on your trusty map that I hope you're looking at right now, you'll see that the Black Sea narrows to the Bosphorus as it moves through Constantinople, opens up again to the Sea of Marmara, then narrows significantly through the Dardanelles that pass the Gallipoli Peninsula, and then eventually open up into the Aegean and the oceans beyond. What happened when Turkey joined the Germans is she became the enemy of Russia and she therefore closed the Dardanelles. When the Dardanelles were closed, what that meant is Russian ships could not get through the Bosphorus and then the Sea of Marmara and the Dardanelles out into the Aegean. So the Russian ships were trapped in the Black Sea. And it was a real blow to the Allies that, that part of Russia's fleet was now trapped in the Black Sea. There was not going to be free trade between the Allies and Russia through that back channel, through the Black Sea. And it was a real issue for the Allies. So that was really the seed of the problem, opening up the Dardanelles, opening up this waterway to get access from the Aegean to eventually the Black Sea. A secondary thought of the Allies, particularly the British, was that if they could open up the Dardanelles, they could send ships to Constantinople and they could bombard Constantinople and hopefully in one fell swoop knock Turkey out of the war. All this, I should add, was the brainchild of a man you may have heard of, Mr Winston Churchill, who at the time was the, uh, the Lord of the Admiralty, so basically the commander of the British Navy, uh, and then, of course, went on to greatness in World War II. But World War I was certainly not his finest hour, and Gallipoli was probably the low point of, uh, of, of his career, I think, I think one of the low points of his life. So when we look back on Churchill, a lot of people in the, uh, in the years since, um, obviously the, the, the years since Churchill achieved greatness in the Second World War, have attempted to change the outlook on Gallipoli because it was such a disaster, and it was a disaster completely of Churchill's manufacture. So Churchill should be blamed for the disaster in the Gallipoli, but there were many other people involved as well who should have known better. So this is the, the 
the seed of the idea that the British and their French allies would send a fleet of ships into the Dardanelles. They would into the Dardanelles. They would they would bombard the forts on either side of the Dardanelles. They would clear the minefields the Turks had laid there, charge through, make their way to Constantinople, and hopefully defeat Turkey in a in a short space of time. So on March 18, 1915, the British and the French sent a fleet of 16 ships into the Dardanelles and started bombarding the forts on both sides of the waterway. And the Turks, of course, in those forts responded quite aggressively and started bombarding the British and the French ships. A combination of the shell fire from the forts and the laying of secret minefields in the Dardanelles that the British and French were not aware of led to the loss of four ships. The British and French lost four ships on that one day alone, March 18. And it's still a day that the Turks celebrate as a wonderful victory, the 18th of March. So you'll see that wherever you go in the Gallipoli area and often throughout Turkey, you'll see signs, street names and universities and public places named after March 18, this great victory over the British and French navies. So the British and French navies turned around, sailed out of the Dardanelles and said, we are not going to attack the Dardanelles again unless troops can capture those forts that have been bombarding us. And so that was the beginning of this whole Gallipoli fiasco, the idea that troops would land on the peninsula, they would charge across the peninsula, overcome the Turks, capture the forts, and the ships could resume their attack along the waterway. So don't forget that. Don't forget that Gallipoli was always intended to be a naval operation. The land operation that occurred afterwards was almost an afterthought, and it obviously grew and grew and grew and just got completely out of hand, but it was always intended to be a naval operation, and the army landings were merely to support that naval naval operation. So they decided, the British and French decided, having forewarned the Turks pretty obviously that an attack was now going to take place, they decided to land troops. And one thing we should throw in here when we talk about numerous things we can mention about the debacle that was Gallipoli is, is even the planning. And I've mentioned this on the podcast before, that the greatest amphibious operation in history was the landings on D-Day in Normandy. Uh, but the greatest landing prior to the D-Day invasion was actually Gallipoli, and most people don't realise that. And the D-Day landings, Normandy, the invasion of Normandy, took nearly two years to plan from the time they began planning it till the execution was nearly two years. Gallipoli, by comparison, took three weeks. So the the difference in the resources that were put in there, the planning, Lord Hamilton, when he went off, General Hamilton, when he went off to command the Gallipoli uh, adventure, went famously that uh, it's it's famously remarked that he left the he left London to catch his ship that would take him to the Mediterranean, carrying only uh, a revolver, a, bo- a notebook and a copy of a French map from the 1850s of the Gallipoli Peninsula. That was all the preparation that he had. So from the start, the Gallipoli adventure was was badly under-resourced uh, and always going to be in trouble. So fast forward to April the 25th, what we now obviously know as Anzac Day. The Australians and the New Zealanders ant- landed at Anzac Cove. Um, it's a whole separate discussion about whether they landed in the right spot or not. The plan was for the Kiwis and the Australians to cut through the peninsula pretty quickly, cut the peninsula in half to stop Turkish reinforcements coming down. Uh, And the British and French, meanwhile, effected a very large landing on the southern toe of the peninsula at a place called Cape Helles. Now, as Australians and New Zealanders, we obviously focus on the actions in the Anzac sector, um, but we should absolutely not overlook Helles, which in many ways was the main part of the story. Most of the troops who fought at Gallipoli were fighting at Helles. Um, and the British and the French had an absolutely terrible time there. If you want a, a, a demonstration, if, if people say to me, why do you think Gallipoli was such a disaster? I usually quote one statistic which sums up the folly of the whole venture from a British and French perspective. So when the British and French landed at five beaches on the southern toe of the Gallipoli Peninsula on the 25th of April, they were set a task for their first day to capture a small village called Krithia and the hill next to that, which was called Archie Baba. So the, that was their first day objective. By the end of the first day, they would have dug in on a line that included both the village of Krithia and Archie Baba Hill. After nine months of fighting and more than 30,000 men killed, the British and the French were still two kilometres short of that objective line which had been set for their first day. Let me just say that again. They, after nine months of fighting and 30,000 deaths, they were still two kilometres short of their objective for the first day. Nothing sums up the Gallipoli folly more succinctly than that terrible, terrible 
statistic. So as the British and the French slogged their way forward from Cape Helles trying to gain ground against the Turks, the Anzacs tried to push their way inland, and as most of us know from even as far back as our school days, that did not go very effectively. And basically both the, the, the British and French forces down in the south and the Anzacs in the centre part of the peninsula were hemmed in by the Turks and both were trapped in that area and spent the rest of their campaign trying to force their way out. And the, the main... Uh, the main attempt to force their way out of this trap that the Turks had locked them in was the landings at Suvla Bay, the, the big August offensive that took place in August 1915. And the idea there was to land new forces at Suvla Bay to the north of the Anzac sector. Meanwhile, the Anzacs would break out of the Anzac sector and link up, and that would that would free up the advance. Um, and, of course, it didn't go to plan. The Suvla landings um, were actually quite effective in the early stages, um, but then poor leadership meant that the they did not advance quickly enough. The Turks were able to send reinforcements and hem the British in at Suvla in the same way they'd hemmed the British in at Helles and the Anzacs at, at uh, in the Anzac sector. And the attacks that took place in the Anzac sector, most famously Lone Pine and the Neck, were not successful at breaking out of the uh, of the line. Uh, so it's it's often a little bit confused that it's. It, I think Peter Weir's film Gallipoli. Um, paints the exact opposite picture of what was going on. But the diversionary attack was actually the attack at Lone Pine. That was the attack designed to pull the Turks away from what was going on further north. Uh, the attack at the Neck was intended to link up with New Zealand troops who had attacked the high point of Chunuk Bear earlier in the morning. And so the idea was that the, the two groups would link up, the Anzacs attacking, the Australians attacking from one sector and the New Zealanders attacking from another. So the attack at the neck, the famous light horse charge, which was so disastrous, was actually intended to be part of a, a supporting operation for the New Zealanders. So it was the attack at Lone Pine that was the diversion. But ironically, Lone Pine was really the only bit of the August offensive that was that was particularly successful. Uh, and so that was really the last effort of the Allies to try and, to try and capture the Gallipoli Peninsula. Uh, several other large actions occurred, uh, places like Hill 60, um, Scimitar Hill, was the biggest and the largest and the last operation of the Gallipoli campaign. So smaller uh, attacks happened throughout the peninsula for the rest of the campaign, but by the end of 1915, with winter closing in, it was obvious that the Allies would not be able to hold those trenches through the winter. Also, the Germans and the Austrians had managed to open up a supply line through Europe, uh, through Bulgaria, to Turkey, and so for the first time the Turks were able to get large guns from their German and Austrian allies and, and ship them overland through Europe and bring those to Gallipoli. So those arrived right at the end of 1915 as well and started absolutely demolishing the Allied positions. So Gallipoli became untenable. They realised it was not going to work uh, and withdrew. The Australians and New Zealanders left the Anzac sector in December 1915 uh, and the British left uh, in January 1916 and the French had already packed up their bags and gone home by then. So that was the Gallipoli disaster, an absolute disaster. Don't let anyone ever tell you anything differently about Gallipoli. It was a folly. It never should have occurred. It was terribly planned. The, the idea was just dumb from the start. It was poorly planned and supported. There were never enough resources. I heard a historian say once that it was like a poker player who never has enough money at the table, that by the time he gets more money and raises his bet, his opponents have raised their bets as well. So we were constantly chasing our tail at Gallipoli. Poor thinking, poor planning, poor leadership. The only shining light, and this is the thing we commemorate on Anzac Day, of course, is the performance of the troops that were there. Not just the Australians, but the Kiwis as well. And of course, the British and the French, and not forgetting the Turks that were there. Um, what we remember about Gallipoli is men doing the impossible under impossible circumstances. Even hanging on at Gallipoli was a huge achievement uh, on the part of the Allies. And when we go there, when you visit Gallipoli and walk the ground, you will see what I'm talking about, that even managing to fight in the heat and the flies and the dust and then the rains and the snow that eventually came in winter and on those unbelievably steep, steep cliffs and the scrub choke gullies, it's just an inhospitable place. So the thought that men could survive there even for a few hours, let alone nine months, is absolutely incredible. So that's what we commemorate at Gallipoli when we go there. And that's why it's so special to go there, why it holds such a special place in all our hearts. And it really should. You know, I'm someone that, that is a fan of remembering not just the Gallipoli story. I, I believe we should tell a, a wider story about the Anzacs throughout the wars that they fought during the 20th century. But I'll always say that Gallipoli deserves its place in our national consciousness just because it was so iconic. This first great action, the combination of the Australians and the New Zealanders and just the unbelievable job we did hanging on in these impossible circumstances. So hopefully that's got your blood boiled up a little bit to go and visit Gallipoli because you really should. It's wonderful and you won't come away disappointed. 
it's such an emotional, wonderful place, and particularly when you stand in those cemeteries and see all the all the men who were lost in those dark days of 1915. So that's the overview of the Gallipoli campaign. And now we're going to talk about specifically, if you want to go there, how to make it happen. It's it's not difficult to go to Gallipoli. It's it's not a difficult place to visit. It's very much on the tourist trail. Um, it's not particularly expensive either. I mean, notwithstanding the fact that you have to fly to Europe to get there, it's not a particularly expensive place to visit uh, Turkey itself and Gallipoli specifically. Um, so how do you get there? The, the gateway to the Gallipoli Peninsula is the city of Istanbul, um, the largest city in Turkey. It's not the capital. Ankara is the capital of Istanbul, of, uh, of Gallipoli, of, I'm sorry, of Turkey. Uh, but um, Istanbul is the largest city and one of the oldest cities in Turkey, a beautiful, beautiful city. The old town of Istanbul is absolutely amazing. And the city itself traverses both continents. The, there's the Asian side and the European side. Now, even though only the smallest part of Turkey is in Europe, most of what we're going to be talking about focuses just coincidentally on the European side. The, the Gallipoli Peninsula is on the European side. Most of the main sites you want to see in Istanbul are on the European side. And when you drive down there, you drive along the European side of the water to get down there. So even though 95% of Turkey is in Asia, most people who visit Gallipoli don't even go to the Asian side at all. They, they spend their whole time on the European side of Turkey. So you're going to fly into Istanbul um, and probably you want to overnight in Istanbul when you get there and spend some time exploring Istanbul. Absolutely amazing. A wonderful, wonderful city. Really one of the world's great cities. So spend some time exploring Istanbul. Get over your jet lag, absorb a bit of the Turkish culture and soak up your time in Istanbul. Just a wonderful city. Do a cruise on the Bosphorus. Really a beautiful experience. Visit all the wonderful sites in Istanbul. Then you're going to head down to Gallipoli. Now it's about, you have to drive down. That's the way to get down there. In the past... Uh, Turkish Airlines have operated flights to Gallipoli, but that isn't the case at the moment. And to be honest, even if they reintroduce flights, it's better to drive yourself down there. If you're traveling independently, you'll need a car. Like most battlefields, you'll need a car to get around, and it's much more convenient just to hire that car in Istanbul. What I usually do is hire the car in, um, in, at Istanbul Airport because it happens to be uh, in the southwest, so it's in the right direction for heading down to the battlefields. There is a new airport opening in Istanbul soon. If it hasn't already opened, it will be very soon. Uh, and everything will change then because it's in a different part of the city. It's up near the Black Sea. Uh, but for the time being, the main airport, Ataturk International Airport, is southwest of Istanbul. So on your way to the battlefields. Aren't we lucky with that? It's the same in France. Through an incredible coincidence, when you go to Paris and want to visit the Western Front battlefields, the airport you fly into, Charles de Gaulle, is north of Paris, uh, in already in the direction of the battlefields. And it's the same in Turkey. The, the airport is southwest of the city and heading off in the direction of the battlefield. So you'll need a car if you're traveling yourself. If you're joining a tour, like one of our tours, it'll all be taken care of for you. But either way, what you're going to do is you're going to drive down the coast, of down along this, past the Sea of Marmara, and eventually down along the Dardanelles coast. It's quite a picturesque drive. Nice views out of across the waterway as you head down. And remembering that these waters are the reason we were at Gallipoli in the first place. So you're getting a taste of the history, even just on the drive down to Gallipoli. So it takes about... If you just drove down there without stopping, it would take about four hours, but probably allow five uh, to get down there. Once you get to Gallipoli, so you arrive on the Gallipoli Peninsula, the key town on the European side, so I'm going to talk about the European side, which from now on means the Gallipoli Peninsula when I say that. And on the other side, the Asian side is also some sites as well. The main town on the European side, so actually on the peninsula itself, is the town of Echabat. Uh, and that town is located on the shores of the Dardanelles um, facing the Asian side of Turkey. Now, there's not a lot at Achar, but there's not a lot of accommodation. There's some small basic hotels. You can stay there if you want to. It's, it's, it's a good little town. It's got restaurants and it's very close to the battlefields. That's the advantage. If you're there, you're close to the battlefields. But the main areas of accommodation are in the town of Çanakkale. And Chinakale is on the other side of the Dardanelles, so it's on the Asian side. And it's a town of about 175,000 people. It's a pretty big town. It's a university, well, city really, a small city. It's a university city. It's got a quite a, a famous city there. And Chinakale is a really nice town in itself and certainly worth visiting while you're in the, the Gallipoli area. So you'll stay in one of those two sites. I should throw a mention in here. If you want to stay in a spot that is as close to the battlefields as you can possibly get, there is only one place to stay, and that's a little, um, really a B and B called the Gallipoli Houses, uh, which is run by a lovely man called Eric Gosson, and it's right next to the battlefields. It's it's inland from a so uh, it's it's in a wonderful spot. And when you sit there having a cold beer at the end of a long day, tramping the battlefields, you're actually looking at the hills 
that form the backdrop at Gallipoli. You're looking at the rear of the Turkish positions during the whole Gallipoli campaign. So look up the Gallipoli houses, uh, and that would be my number one recommendation for the place to stay if you want to be right in the heart of the battlefields, if you want to be right there where the fighting occurred. That's the spot to stay. If you want to do other things while you're in the area, I'd probably suggest you stay uh, either at Achabat or at Chinakali. And the advantage of staying in Chinakali as well is not only does it have a lot more accommodation, a lot more things to do, restaurants and nightlife and, and great pubs and, and other attractions, it's also got it's also close to ancient Troy, uh, which is just down the coast, uh, and all this, the tales of the Trojan horse, etc. Et so that's certainly worth visiting while you're in Chinakali as well. So those are your options. Most people stay in Chinakali because there's a greater range of accommodation there and more to do and see in Chinakali. Um, lots of people stay in Achabat, but there's a lot less facilities in the small town of Achabat and dedicated hardcore battlefield visitors should stay at the Gallipoli Houses. It's wonderful service and in a fantastic location next to the battlefields. Chinakali's advantage is also its disadvantage. It's, it's on the Asian side of the Dardanelles, which means you get beautiful views across the water and you get to look back across the, at the Gallipoli Peninsula. But the downside is every day when you want to go to and from the battlefields, you have to get on a ferry and cross the Dardanelles. It doesn't take long. It's only about 20 minutes or so. You can take your car. If you travel with a tour group, the tour group will almost certainly be staying in Chinakali and every day the bus will just jump on the ferry uh, and head across. So ferries are very frequent uh, and, cross the, uh, and cross the waterways to the Gallipoli Peninsula. Once you get there, it's only a short drive of 10 or 15 minutes across the peninsula to the Anzac sector and about 20 minutes south to get to Helles, the main, the main British and French sector. How much time should you allow for your Gallipoli journey? Um, you could spend, I mean, you could spend weeks there. It's a, it's a wonderful battlefield and I have spent several weeks walking the battlefields. For most people, I would say a couple of days. Please don't just do a day trip. You can just do day trips. And if you do a larger tour of Turkey, often they will stop at Gallipoli just for the day, which I suppose is better than not seeing it at all. But you're really going to miss some pretty key points if you only spend a day there. So if you're planning to go because you want to go and see Gallipoli, please allow more than just one day, uh, at least a couple of days to do all the key sites. Um, ideally, you'd want to spend three or four days. We spend four solid days there over Anzac Day. We spend four days and five nights at Gallipoli, and that enables you to see all the sites plus participate in the uh, in the Anzac service. Um, I'll just touch on the fact that there are three key locations you're going to want to visit while you're there, and I'll come back to them in more detail. So there's the Anzac sector where the Australians and the New, Ze New Zealanders fought. We owe it to our British and French comrades and to our understanding of the story to also go to Helles down in the south. It's, it's not far from Anzac and it tells a very interesting part of the whole Gallipoli story. Um, and also, if you have time, go to Suvla, north of the Anzac sector where those August landings occurred. It's, uh, so those are the three key areas you want to go to on the peninsula. If you have extra time, you can also go and see some sites on the Asian side uh, where fighting occurred as well. This is where the Turks had a lot of large forts, where the French fought in the opening days. So there's a lot of interesting sites to see as well on the Asian side. Um, to help you make sense of all this, I wrote a book several years ago called Gallipoli, the Battlefield Guide. And please pick up a copy of that to, uh, to give you some more information about the sites that you can actually see Gallipoli, where to stay and how to get around. You get a free copy of that book if you book on one of our tours. Uh, and if you're planning to self-drive, it is a really a great resource to help you get around. So I'm not just saying that because I wrote it. I wrote it because I wanted to help people get around. So it's really an expanded version of this podcast. It, it tells you in great detail where to go, what to see, and most importantly, what occurred at each site. So grab a copy of that book online or at bookshops, Gallipoli, The Battlefield Guide by Matt McLaughlin. Um, so as I discussed before, uh, where to stay when you are there. So just finishing up on how much time, I would say three days would be the ideal amount of time. You can do it in two, uh, but three days would be ideal. Three days touring the peninsula plus traveling time to get there and to get away. Um, I've already touched on where to stay, but my recommendation would be if you're only there to see the battlefields and you're short on time, stay on the peninsula, stay in a charbot or at the Gallipoli houses and you can get out there much quicker. Um, if you've got more time and you want to see a little bit further afield, stay at Chinakali and uh, explore some of the great sites there. I'll be heading over to Gallipoli for Anzac Day this year and I'll be staying at Chinakali um, and enjoying the great waterfront restaurants and pubs and catching up with a lot of Turkish friends. It's really a great, a great place to stay. Just quickly, when to go is a really important question. Now, 
obviously any time is is a good time to visit the battlefields whenever it fits in with your plans. And people do visit in winter, they do visit out of season. But if you're planning a trip, obviously you want the, the conditions to be on your side. So I will say that the climate in Gallipoli is tough out of season. In the middle of summer, it is baking hot, really hot, 40 degrees plus. And in winter, it snows. So you get some quite extremes of temperature in Gallipoli as the Anzac veterans certainly attested to. Uh, and so you probably, ideally, you'd want to go in those shoulder seasons, like lots of Europe, which is sort of the spring and autumn, is probably the ideal time to go. Summer is a lovely time to go. The advantage in summer is you can swim as well. The days are very long. It's a nice time to be there. There's some lovely beaches in the area. So if you go in summer, you can take advantage of the of the, the wonderful beaches and swimming in the Aegean, which is always a, a real treat. Um, but the shoulder season is also a good time to go. A little bit cool. That's when you sort of get 20 to 25 degree days and cooler nights. Um, and is is probably the, the ideal time to go. Now, what I will say here is Anzac Day is a really important point to mention here. If you've been to the Western Front for Anzac Day, Gallipoli is quite different. And the reason I say that is that Gallipoli is a very compact area. And so when thousands of tourists descend for Anzac Day, it does get quite crowded. Now, half of the Australians who visit Gallipoli every year go for Anzac Day. So when, it, when the numbers are busy... It's, it's usually about something like about 10,000 people go for Anzac Day and about 10,000 go during other times of the year. So if you don't go for Anzac Day, you have 364 days to choose from where there will be no crowds at Gallipoli. And often when you go to Gallipoli, any time except for Anzac Day, uh, you don't see many other people. You'll occasionally run into Australians wandering around. Um, but you often have these incredible sights completely yourself. And it's, it's an unbelievable experience to stand in these iconic spots, particularly the cemeteries, to stand in like Lone Pine Cemetery or Beach Cemetery or Arubanu Cemetery or any of these wonderful places and have the whole thing to yourself is really quite a remarkable experience. So I, I don't, when I go to Gallipoli, usually I don't go for Anzac Day and the times that I've been there, you often have the whole place to yourself, which is really part of that special experience. I'm not trying to talk you out of going for Anzac Day because Anzac Day is iconic at Gallipoli. If you want to go for Anzac Day, if that's your primary visit for being there, then absolutely go on Anzac Day. It's it's a wonderful time to be there. And the fact that there's lots of people there is part of that shared experience. There's always It's a very Australian feeling on Anzac Day or a very New Zealand feeling if you're there uh, as a New Zealander. And it's a very wonderful shared experience. So if you want to go, then that Anzac Day, if the Anzac Day service is important for you, then absolutely go for Anzac Day. Ideally, what I'd say is go twice. Go for Anzac Day so you can enjoy that experience with everyone else and share that commemoration and then go at another time of the year uh, when it's a little less crowded. That would certainly be my recommendation. So those three sites that, that I mentioned, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about what you can see in each of those sites. So we'll start with the main one, Anzac, from a, an Australian and New Zealand perspective. So the Anzacs landed on Anzac Cove, which is a tiny little shingly beach. Um, and in many ways, they were lucky because it's protected on both sides by headlands, which meant that the Turks couldn't see very clearly into Anzac Cove, so couldn't basically blow the hell out of the Anzacs and knock them off the peninsula. They then pushed inland and they, they dug in. There's a series of three ridges at Gallipoli in the Anzac sector, which are difficult to, to define when you're standing there on the ground. But they, they sort of neatly encapsulate what was going on. So the first ridge of the hills immediately over Anzac Cove, where the Anzacs first landed, which they captured very early on the morning of the 25th of April. They then pushed on to the second ridge. And on second ridge of such famous sites as Lone Pine, Chunuk Bear, Quinn's Post, The Neck, all the famous signs, uh, sites at the Anzac sector are on second ridge. And the simple reason is that the Turks pushed forward and met the Anzacs and they began fighting on that first day, on the 25th of April, and where both sides dug in was on the second ridge. The Turks dug in on one side, the Australians and New Zealanders dug in on the other side, and the front line effectively did not move very much for the rest of the campaign. So when we talk about second ridge, that's the main area of the fighting at Gallipoli. And we should certainly understand that as well. The beach is very important. Anzac Cove and the, uh, and the adjoining North Beach, where a lot of fighting occurred and where the Dawn Service is now held, are both iconic sites and very, very important. But what we should remember is that was not where the bulk of the fighting occurred. Don't be fooled into thinking that the landing at Gallipoli was anything like Saving Private Ryan, where soldiers came ashore under a hail of, of machine gun fire. That is absolutely not what occurred. It was almost unopposed, the landing at Gallipoli. The Turks were taken completely by surprise that the Allies actually landed in that inhospitable spot on the coast, and there were not many Turks there. There was only 160 Turks defending the entire sector, when the Anzacs first landed and those Turks were either killed very quickly or they 
retreated in the face of the thousands of British, uh, sorry, New Zealand and Australian troops that landed. So the Anzacs pushed inland very quickly after landing early on the morning of the 25th of April. By that afternoon, or actually by later in the morning, Turkish reinforcements had arrived and the real fighting had begun. So most of the fighting and the dying occurred at Gallipoli on that second ridge, which became the front line. And when you go there today, there's a road that runs along the length of Second Ridge and no man's land in many places was only as wide as that road. And as you drive along it, if you're heading north, then on your right-hand side uh, were the Turkish trenches and on your left were the Anzac trenches. So that's the main feature. The third ridge behind it sort of is the highest ridge in the whole area. It overlooks Second Ridge and that was the Turkish position throughout the campaign. So when I mentioned before, if you stay at the Gallipoli houses, that wonderful B&B, you actually look onto the back of Third Ridge from your accommodation so it's a wonderful spot so third ridge was where the turks were based and it's still worth exploring there's a lot of interesting sites there but the anzacs a few of the anzacs managed to get onto various points on third ridge only on the first day but they never got there again Uh, so the third ridge is definitely turkish territory so the two main sectors you'll want to visit in the anzac sector of Gallipoli is the beach area and this is spelled out again in my battlefield guide in Gallipoli the battlefield guide you want to visit visit the beach area sites such as um, Anzac Cove of course North Beach Hell Spit Araburnu um, Shrapnel Valley these these famous sites Monash Valley these famous sites that are all in the beach sector and then you drive up to the second ridge and then heading up second ridge you go to places like Lone Pine Johnston's Jolly, and then the famous posts, Steele's posts, Courtney's post, Quinn's post, probably the most famous of them. Uh, Heading further north, you you head up past the Neck, Baby 700, which was a famous site, particularly in the opening days of the campaign. And eventually you head all the way up to Chunuk Bear, which is the the main spot the New Zealanders attacked in August and is now the site of their national memorial at Gallipoli. So that's that's the road that goes up Second Ridge. There's a lot more sites to it just than that, so please... um, Check my book out for for more information about each of those sites and the other sites you can see. Um, The interesting thing about this is you can go further north than Chunuk Bear. Chunuk Bear is kind of the end of the the paved road and it's sort of the end of the tourist circuit. If you're there, particularly on your own and you're keen for a bit more adventure, you can go further north than Chunuk Bear. And I recommend you do this if you are keen to discover more than the average tourist sees on a day trip to Gallipoli. In the, during the August offensive, General Monash, who went on to greatness on the Western Front as the commander of the Australians, uh, was the commander of the 4th Brigade at Gallipoli uh, during, the, during the entire campaign. And during the August offensive, his 4th Brigade had a pivotal role to play in the attack uh, on, uh, during the August offensive. Now, the, the, the concept was that groups of Australian and New Zealand troops would break out of Anzac and they would swing north, they'd capture the high ground and then they'd come charging down basically Third Ridge, they'd come charging down these ridges and and overwhelm the Turks. Uh, But what happened is they got lost in the dark and the gullies, and Monash in particular made a terrible error. Um, He actually, his troops troops took a wrong turn coming out of the the gully that they were marching up, and and they were in fact in the wrong place. They were reporting that they were in a different location to where they actually were. So Monash was making plans based on looking at maps and thinking his troops were in one location when they were actually half a kilometre away in a different direction. Uh, and it was it was after the campaign that Monash actually discovered his mistake. He didn't he didn't realise his mistake until after the the campaign was long over. So it was not Monash's finest hour. He did an okay job, and I think people came away with respect for him. His men came away with respect for him as a leader. And of course, the famous the most famous uh, thoroughfare in Gallipoli is named after him, Monash Valley. Um, but it was not his finest hour. Um, and ironically, the 8th of August, which in 1918 was the day of his greatest achievement on the Western Front, the Battle of Armion, which took place on the 8th of August. Uh, the 8th of August, 1915, was probably his lowest point at Gallipoli. Just a lot of mistakes were made there, which cost a lot of lives. Uh, ironically, three years to the day before his most famous action in France. So what you can do when you're at Gallipoli is you can follow in the footsteps of Monash and his 4th Brigade by heading further north from Chunuk Bear. And what they were trying to do is capture the highest hill in the whole sector, which is called Hill 971. They never got anywhere near it, but you can head up to Hill 971 yourself and you can have a look from the Turkish perspective of the absolute maze of ground that the Australians and New Zealanders were fighting their way through. So do it if you if you can. It's a dirt road up there. It's a bit rough. It's a, bit, a little bit of an adventure, but I encourage you to do it. If you have your own car, it's probably a bit too far to walk, but if you have your own car... Drive up that dirt road. It's a bit rocky. It's a bit of an adventure, but head up to Hill 971. 
there's a platform up there which is for um, local fire control for forest fires. When you get up there, you can stand on that platform and look over this tangle of country that the Australians and New Zealanders were trying to capture in the August offensive. And you can see pretty quickly why the, the attack bogged down when you look at some of that territory. Probably the harshest terrain on the entire peninsula was where the where Monash and his men and the New Zealanders were asked to attack uh, during the August offensive. So definitely do that. Um, you can even, if you want to, you can even, if you're down at the beach area, you can even head out and follow in the footsteps of the, the attack that uh, of, of Monash and his men up through this these tangle of gullies it's really hard going it's really choked with very thorny scrub only do it if you have long trousers long pants don't do it alone tell people where you're going because it's very isolated up there there's snakes there in summer there's wild dogs at every time of the year i'm not painting a very good picture of it but do it with a, a couple of mates and you won't regret it it's a wonderful experience to get up there and trek in the footsteps of monash and his men so these are these are sort of we'll, we'll touch on more of these things with peter hart next week but these extra things you can do at Gallipoli that most people don't do. Uh, for the New Zealanders and, and the Australians as well, there's a wonderful walk uh, that follows in the footsteps of the Kiwis from the beach sector up to, during the attack in August all the way up to uh, to Second and Third Ridge. Um, and it goes up the back of Rhododendron Ridge, which is a famous Kiwi battlefield. I'd suggest you don't do it the way the Kiwis did it when they did it uphill in the dark. I'd suggest you do it the other way, start up the top. Um, and walk back down. You can do it from the top of Chunuk Bear and actually walk back down. There's a path leading from behind Chunuk Bear uh, back down to the beach. But then, of course, you'll need someone to come and pick you up from the beach because you'll be a long way from from where you began. But there's a whole range of of walks that you can do in Gallipoli off the beaten track, which are certainly worth doing. I highlight most of them in my book, um, and I'll talk about some more of them when we speak to Peter Hart next week. I was hearing, I'm going to explore, there was a, a new walkway that's opened up in the Anzac sector, which I think goes down Walker's Ridge, I believe. Um, so I'm looking forward to exploring that as well. The Turks have, have carved a bit of a path through the scrub. There's a problem at Gallipoli that the Anzacs didn't have. When the Anzacs arrived at Gallipoli, it was farming country and goats were widespread throughout the region. They obviously scarpered during the, as soon as the guns started firing during the campaign. But for decades and probably centuries before the Anzacs arrived, goats had, had roamed all over the Gallipoli Peninsula and they kept the scrub down very low. So there wasn't a lot of... There wasn't a lot of vegetation. It was very scrubby, low vegetation when the Anzacs first arrived. And within a small amount of time, they'd taken every twig and every stick and every bush they could find and burnt them for firewood. So if you look at photos of the Gallipoli Peninsula during the campaign, it's pretty barren. There wasn't a lot of undergrowth. There wasn't a lot of, of tree. There were certainly no trees at all, um, but not even many bushes or, or much scrub. It was it was quite denuded, the, the landscape. It's certainly changed today. And it's something that's a bit of a bugbear of mine. I, I wouldn't mind seeing some goats get back in there or, or doing a bit of scrub clearing because since it's been a national park since the war, the scrub has absolutely exploded. And now every valley and every gully at Gallipoli is absolutely choked with thick, thorny scrub and you just can't get through. So people say to me all the time, I'd love to walk up Monash Valley, which was the main thoroughfare the Australians took to get from the beach up to the front line at Second Ridge. I have done it once. And I don't recommend it. It's just so hard. There's no pathways to follow. You just basically have to bash your way through the scrub. And it's a rewarding experience if you do it and then climb up to Quinn's Post or climb up Pope's Hill or or one of the other uh, iconic places at the front line. It's it's certainly a lovely experience to have done, but it's not fun. It's just There's just too much scrub. You can't see where you're going. The scrub is impenetrable in places. It's just so thick and it's thorny and sharp and painful. So... If you're going to go off off the off the beaten track in Gallipoli, definitely wear long sleeves, even in summer, long pants and long sleeves because you get cut to shreds otherwise on the thorns. Um, and tell someone where you're going. Only do it and can don't do it alone. Do it with with a mate and tell people where you're going in case you get lost or or injured because that is a very real risk when you're off the beaten path. You don't have to go off the beaten path at all to get the full experience of Gallipoli. The main sites, the the most important sites, are very accessible by paved roads and walkways uh, so you do not have to go off the beaten path and you wouldn't want to if you didn't have a lot of time if you're only doing one or two days don't go off the beaten path stick to the main tracks um, but if you do have more time and you could spend really a week at Gallipoli doing more exploring there's some wonderful off the beaten path explorations to be made so check out my book look on the web listen to the podcast next week with Peter Hart and we'll reveal some of those but it's really worth doing if you get the chance just to get a very different perspective of Gallipoli away from the maddening crowds. So that's really the Anzac sector, um, the, probably the one that obviously most of the people listening to this podcast are going to be interested in. But please do me this favour and do yourself this favour when you go to Gallipoli, visit Helles as well. Visit Suvla too, 
but as a bare minimum, please also visit Cape Helles. So if, if I ever send people to Gallipoli, I say it's two days because you need one day in Anzac, one day in Helles. I would never let anyone just go for one day and skip Helles because it's so important to the story. So as I said, at Helles, the British landed on five beaches at the same time the Anzacs were coming ashore at Anzac Cove. Um, but here in the British sector, it really was like saving Private Ryan. Those landings were strongly opposed, most of them, by the Turks, and particularly at a site called V Beach, which is one of the main sites uh, on the southern tip of the peninsula. There was a fort there, uh, subtle by here. Fort is there next to the beach, and the British came ashore and had a terrible, terrible time landing on this beach. Um, there's, a, there's a debate as to whether the, the Turks had machine guns there but even if they didn't they certainly had a lot of riflemen and they absolutely cut the British down so it's, it's one of those typical horrifying scenes where the water was soaked red with blood from the soldiers coming ashore um, but a lot of Victoria Crosses were won in these places um, and a lot of brave men died and today when you go to V Beach you can visit the ruins of the castle you can walk on the beach where those men came ashore and were cut down and you can visit the wonderful V Beach Cemetery where lots of them remain. It's a, pretty, it's a strange thing during the summer because families come down, Turkish families come down to play on the beach uh, in the shadow of this cemetery where so many people died. So I always feel a little bit funny about that. I do at Normandy as well when you see people, when you see kids building sandcastles on Omaha Beach. I don't mean from a respect point of view, I, I don't mean that at all. People are perfectly entitled to use these sites as they want to but I, I wouldn't feel, <laughs> knowing the history there, I'd feel a bit odd making sandcastles and playing in, on the sand where when I knew so many people died. But maybe that's just me. So that's that's V Beach and there's other beaches as well. W Beach, X Beach, S Beach, all named after letters of the alphabet. And they're all really worth visiting. Helles is a wonderful, wonderful place to visit. It's very big compared to Anzac. There's lots of amazing sites. The stories of what went on at Helles are heartbreaking and gripping at the same time. Just incredible, wonderful stories. Again, pick up a copy of my Battlefield Guide to Gallipoli to, to hear all these stories and to, to read about itineraries that you can follow when you travel around Helles. So some wonderful sites there, including the town of Krithia uh, is now called Alcitepe. Uh, and the, the village is still there. You can still climb Archie Baba Hill and see the remains of Turkish trenches and see the Turks, see the view the Turks had looking out all over the uh, the British and the French lines, the incredible, impressive French memorial and the wonderful, incredible Turkish memorial, which is called the Martyrs Memorial down on the southern tip, which records Turkish troops that were there. I should talk about the Turkish contribution a little bit. Um, the Turks are quite rightfully very proud of everything that went on there, but Turkey's going through a funny phase at the moment. Turkey is a country that's always embraced mythology. You know, it's a, it's 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 an ancient town um, that has always embraced mythology and 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 this idea of a, a a larger story than than just just the basic facts. And that that that's reflected a little bit in what goes on uh, in Turkey today. Um, that the the Turkish people they're they're also having a little bit of an internal conflict. The the government is quite fundamentalist. The Islamic government there. Um, and they're trying to paint Gallipoli as a story of defeat for the infidels, people who support the secular nature of Turkey, because Turkey is, of course, a secular country. It's not a, it's not a religious country. It's a secular country. But people that support the, the secular side of it, which was led by Ataturk, also embrace the Gallipoli story because this is where Ataturk got his start as a young colonel fighting against the, the Anzacs. So both sides conflict each other and it means that a lot of Turks come and visit Gallipoli and it actually creates a little bit of tension between Turkish people sometimes, the people that support Ataturk and the people that support the more fundamentalist government. So there's a little bit of conflict there and the sites that are important to the Turkish people um, uh, are, uh, reflect the mythology a little bit. They have, for example, a lot of what they call symbolic cemeteries. So you would go to if you go to the Anzac cemeteries or the British and French cemeteries, there's bodies in the graves. And this is actually a really odd thing when you describe it, but the Turkish cemeteries, all of their dead were buried in mass graves. So the mass graves until fairly recently have not even marked. They, they were just, the men were just buried out in the fields in unmarked graves. And so what the Turks started doing is because they had no cemeteries and they noted that all these Western tourists were coming to visit their cemeteries and the Turks had nothing in reply, they started building what they call symbolic cemeteries. And so these are cemeteries laid out with headstones um, but there's no bodies buried in them. They're just a, they're they're a symbol, and that you know that's a kind of uniquely Turkish way to do it. The, they reflect the sacrifice made by Turkish people without actually reflecting the, the the burial locations of their soldiers. It's good to see that in recent years the mass graves have now been marked and can now be visited as well. Uh, and so they they're now sites where you can go and visit, and they're quite astounding. You go and visit these mass graves that have two or three or five thousand bodies in them of Turkish men killed during the fighting. 
So there's also a wonderful French cemetery and memorial at Gallipoli. Most people, including the French themselves, don't realise that the French even participated in the Gallipoli campaign, yet they lost um, more than twice as many people killed as the Australians did in the Gallipoli campaign. So definitely go and visit the French cemetery as well and a whole heap of other wonderful sites at Cape Hellas. There's many more sites that I can go into here. I'll talk again to Peter Hart about details of really interesting things to visit, but, but please... Don't disrespect the story of Gallipoli by only visiting the Anzac sector. Also go to Helles and walk the ground. There's also Australian involvement in Helles as well. There's a couple of very key sites for the Australians too. So you're following in the Australian and the New Zealand story by going to Helles as well. So please do that. And then if you have time, also go to Suvla in the north. Suvla is very spread out. It's also very isolated. It's The, the roads are not good there. If it's been raining, you won't get through at all, even in a four-wheel drive often. It's just isolated farm country, but there's some wonderful memorials and cemeteries up in Suvla too that are certainly worth taking in. So if you wanted the, the complete Gallipoli story, you'll want to do the Anzac sector, the Helles sector, and the Suvla sector to learn about what went on during the whole campaign. But... Please do it. I mean, that's that's really my overview. I hope that's given you good advice about how to get there and where to stay and what to do when you're there. I'm really looking forward to talking to Peter next week when we're going to dig a little bit further as to some of the adventures you can have in Gallipoli. And Peter is the king of bush bashing to find interesting parts of Gallipoli that are not often visited. So he'll have some good secret tips for places that you would not know that uh, you can visit unless you uh, listen to the podcast with Peter. So I'm really looking forward to that. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion of Gallipoli. If you want to go, I should mention um, that you can come with with my tour company, with Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours. We'd love to have you there. Our main Gallipoli products are our Anzac Day tour, which is our most most popular way to visit Gallipoli for Anzac Day. We also have a walking tour, which we've launched for the first time this year. Uh, it's new for 2019, um, which is really a great way to explore Gallipoli. So imagine spending a week actually walking the ground. So we, we drive out in the morning. You stay in nice accommodation, then you drive out in the morning in the touring coach, spend the day walking the battlefields, jump back on the coach in the afternoon and you're back in time for dinner and a, and a cool beer at the end of a long day. But the walking tour of Gallipoli is going to be really something very special that I'm excited that we've launched for this year. Um, and also at any other time of the year, we can do a private tour for you for, for two or three days to head down and explore in the company of a historian. Like all our tours, uh, we employ only the best historians. So uh, wonderful people that really bring the story to life. So that's Gallipoli. Do it. Get over there. Visit it. It's just such a wonderful site. And now that that travel warning has been upgraded, um, you don't have to have concerns about visiting. Just just be sensible. Typical things about, you know, look out for, make sure you don't do silly things like walking around with expensive jewellery and cameras or leaving your bags unattended. Just, just sensible, normal tourist things and you'll be absolutely fine in Turkey. It's a wonderful place to go. I encourage everyone to get over there and visit Gallipoli at some stage. And I also encourage you to tune in next week to the podcast uh, to hear Peter Hart. I think that'll be out on Monday. We'll be re- releasing that podcast. So only in a few days' time, hear uh, Peter Hart talking about Gallipoli and the great adventures you can have walking the ground there. So until you hear from me again, thanks very much for tuning in.